Trevor. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Daryl. Just one question I'd like to ask you. One of the cornerstones of any economy is education. And Zimbabwe's got a, well, had, had or has a, an incredible reputation in terms of the education of its people with the um, A-levels and O-levels, just to mention some. And where is Zimbabwe now relative to that? Because I think education will play an underlying or a very important role going forward to the prosperity of any country? Um, the Robert Mugabe's revolution, I mean, you might hate the man or like the man, but one thing that he did was uh, he impacted positively on Zimbabwe through his education policy and through his health policy, ensuring that there is a, cl a clinic within walking distance of every village um, and within suburbs and you know expanding education free education uh, to to the majority of the, of the population that is being reversed at a at a at a very high speed uh, and you will notice that um, uh, the quality of the schools has deteriorated quite significantly teachers are leaving uh, education as a sector and as a profession does not have the same respect that it has Investment in education in Zimbabwe has declined quite significantly compared to uh, the, the, the other sectors, which explains why uh, I didn't mention, you know, uh, we now have almost every year uh, teacher strikes uh, because teachers are not being given uh, the remuneration that's, that's, that's important for them to keep on, to keep on teaching. So education is, is important. Uh, the thing with, with uh, Robert Mugabe is that he educated Zimbabweans. I think he realized down the line, he actually, if, if, if he actually said at some point that uh, these people are too clever and too educated, he then realized the danger of an educated uh, population. And when you've educated people and you've not been able to create, to allow an environment for public, a free enterprise rather, to create jobs, those people become a threat. Uh, they begin to be uh, potential to destabilize society, but much more in a negative way. They have options to go to should things get bad within the country. And we've seen a lot of Zimbabweans. I mean, the, the most, most Zimbabweans run the financial sector in South Africa. They are all over the, all over the world. We've lost uh, quite, quite a lot of people. So the, the, the quick answer to your, to your question is, uh, it, it isn't what it used to be. But the worrying thing for me, uh, and I think this is important, is I say that the biggest challenge that any leader that comes into Zimbabwe right now has is not infrastructure. It's not the economy. It's this. How are you going to turn around the culture of, I don't have a farm, I want a farm, I can walk into Trevor's farm and get it. How are you going to reverse the culture that I don't agree with you, you are my enemy, I can kill you, I can murder you? Headlines right now in Zimbabwe are um, opposition member Tendai Biti, who used to be our Minister of Finance, who is our neighbor. Um, people with machetes uh, uh, went to his place yesterday and beat up his security guard and stuff and, and they went away. How do you reverse that mentality? That disagreeing does not mean that you are my enemy and I wish you dead. It's going to take a lot of work. This is for me why uh, I'm disenchanted when I see the quality of leadership that we have there. Because it's not just about roads and infrastructure, it's how do we get back what we had at, Ind at independence, uh, where we valued life, where we respected each other, where we gave each other way on the roads. If you drive in Harare right now, the chaos is something else. If you believe that you drive on the left or right side and suddenly you see somebody coming from the other side, on your side, that's what's happening in Zimbabwe now. How do you reverse that? So there's been a social engineering of who is a Zimbabwean. Um, when we went back to Zimbabwe in 2017, Alec, and we, my wife and I were like, you guys, what, what are you doing? And people said, don't worry, in two years' time we'll be doing what we are doing. Are you? Oh, I find myself doing it. <laughs> uh, Alec, Trevor, not a question exactly. Allow me a remark on the land issue and how the Republic of Namibia has handled land reform. It might be of interest. I've been a farmer in Namibia 
and I'm now in retirement. I've been a president of the Namibia Agriculture Union for four years, and uh, I'm pretty conversant with what has happened there. Namibia had, since 1995, a law requiring all commercial farmland that was for sale to be offered to government first. Government would go and inspect and see whether it was suitable for what they call resettlement, or they would issue, if they don't want it, the land, a waiver, and then the land could be sold on the free market. Within uh, the last, well, it's what, 17, 27 years now, we've had from 36 million hectares of commercial land, 36 million hectares of commercial farmland, 15 million hectares have changed ownership basically from white hand into black hand without a single farm having been expropriated without compensation. But the vast majority of that land has been bought against market price. Government was prepared and still is prepared to buy against market price. What we have seen, and this is where we have come in from the Agricultural Union with supportive programs, we've seen a dramatic drop in productivity of that land. There's no doubt about it. And the big issue is, and that's where we are trying to assist, to raise the level of competence of the new farmers to make them equally or nearly equally productive as their former white Namibian farmers have been. But the big issue I want to emphasize here is, through that clever management by government, the steam has been taken out of the, out of the pot. And land issue as such, commercial land issue, I'm not talking about uh, serviced municipal land, that's a big issue. But commercial ownership of commercial farmland is not really an issue anymore in Namibia. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. And I think it once again shows that we have so much to learn from not just each other, but in, in a national sense from, from, the, from the region. Yeah. I, I've got a different question while we wait for the next one. Can I just chip in mm, on that? Of course. The, the, I mean, obviously, because of time, the, the, the situation in Zimbabwe, as far as land is concerned, actually, it's, it's, um, it's worrying because the, the, la the, the land expropriation in Zimbabwe continues against black farmers and white farmers. Okay? That's what people need to understand. Land expropriation in Zimbabwe continues. The land invasions are still, are still continuing. He, and here's the thing. So you, Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe, you have 99 year leases, not title deeds. And as a result, the banking sector is not funding agriculture because there's no, there's no co collateral. But much more importantly than that, it has been left an open-ended thing whereby, as we're talking, I mean, maybe the last land invasions were about six or nine months ago. So it's an ongoing thing. The land issue remains a blank check that any future politician will sign when they want uh, polit political su support from, from whatever section. What's required is an act of parliament, similar to the act of parliament that says there should be land expropriation, that says there will no more be land expropriation from now on. We need something of that sort. As we sit here, in as much as I've, I've outlined to you the crops that are available, uh, the, the good things that are available as far as agriculture is concerned, the ownership of land is still an issue that's out there. And the banks, the financial sector is saying, land in Zimbabwe is not bankable. You can't bring it to us as collateral. What does that do to the long-term uh, uh, nature of, uh, of, of agriculture and investment in farming? While we're waiting for, ah, there is a question in the front there. Is there another one over there? Yeah. And one, sorry, this side, okay. JP, you can start. Thank you, Alex, and <coughs> thanks for an interesting presentation. Just two, two quick um, comments and then a question. Uh, I think I've noticed Helen is back, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that you've um, brought us back to, to reality um, with emphasizing um, black nationalism as a, as a political reality in your comment about the DA versus the EFF in... Uh, in Helen's Triangle. That's the, that's the first thing. And as far as changing mindsets is concerned, I think there's no better 
example than Rwanda. Uh, we had the opportunity to visit the country and what was a lot more impressive than the guerrillas was um, leadership in Rwanda that used two of Helen's principles, accountability and discipline, rule of law. And I think that is, um, that is the crux. And now the question is, is there a difference between enforcing discipline and xenophobia? Mm. I, I think there's a big difference, you know. I, I, like you, my wife and I have visited Rwanda, very impressive. Uh, and I read uh, the country of uh, many hills, I can't remember, uh, uh, President Kagame's book. But there is a change of mindset. But underneath in Rwanda, there's fear. And the biggest question I have is, how sustainable is what President Paul Kagame doing? Would what he's done and set in motion survive him? And the big, my answer to that question is, I doubt it. Because there are ethnic factors uh, that are associated with that forced, forced uh, uh, compliance or forced change, as, as it were. So I'm really concerned about Rwanda and the sustainability of the momentum that uh, President Kadame has set in place. Is what he has done uh, good and something to be, to be copied for as long as it is not forced, for as long as it is inclusive, in the sense that it's not inclusive, it's, it's benefiting a certain ethnic group, uh, therefore creating the same reasons why we had the genocide uh, earlier on. So I'm concerned about the, Rwanda, the Rwanda experience. I admire what they're doing right now, but I always, I always ask myself, how sustainable is this? What will happen when, when uh, President Kagame is gone? Maybe those are unjustified concerns. History might prove me wrong, and I hope it does. Cape independence. Sorry? Cape independence. <laughs> Wow, I, I didn't see that coming. Okay, and I'll, I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from ethnicity, it comes from Gagwa looking after his people, mm. his group. It comes from the July riots where it was Zulu people. We heard here from Jason McCormick, who's uh, at, at BNC3, where his shopping centers were attacked. They went into it. We had the same story from Gigi Alcock, who is a, a Zulu with a white skin. Uh, ethnicity mm. is strong. Uh, the Cape Independence people say, if you take the Western Cape, they've never voted. Mm. Well, maybe not never, but they certainly haven't for a long time voted for the ANC. So why should they be subjected to mm. policies that are made by people with whom they have very little in common, mm. politically? Yeah. So what, what would your thought, from all, everything you know, and mm. you're in a beautiful position here, mm. you know South Africa, you, you, you obviously know Zimbabwe, you know the differences in Zimbabwe between the south and the north? Yeah. You know, the, the, I think the, 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 my starting point, Alec, would be, c c is it possible to look at the issues that the people asking for CAP independence are agitating about? What are the issues? Can those issues be addressed within uh, the unitary South African state, which I think they can be? I think the Cape independence movement, uh, for me, uh, is predicated on the disenchantment with what central government is doing. Um, and what South Africa re really needs right now is a united South Africa that is led by, uh, like I said, a visionary principled leadership that cares about the interests of all South Africans. Ethnicity I mean, we're seeing the provincialism that is, you know, rampant throughout the world, uh, that we're all retaining to our, uh, our, our tribal uh, uh, small clique groups, but that's not going to deliver uh, the future that South, Af South Africa wants. My thing would be, it's unwise. Um, the right thing to, to do would be to address the issues, that the legitimate issues that the people in Cape Town are raising. What are those issues? They're centrally, they're governance issues. Why can't those governance issues be addressed within a, a unitary state? I see more disadvantages than advantages of, of having a, 
an independent Cape Town. I mean, my wife would love to go there and drink more wine, but uh, it wouldn't be a sustainable option. <laughs> Lost, uh, not, oh, oh, Helen, I knew you were back. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pass, sorry, let's... let's I'll be, I'll I, be quick. I, I, No, I'm sorry, I'm gonna give the mic to Helen if you don't mind. Okay. okay. Sure. Here we go, no, no, we've got no time left. We've got 55 seconds, so you've got a 10 second question. All right, I don't know what um, Mr. Ngube said, <laughs> but I can imagine what he said. He said, there is something like black nationalism. It is real, it is powerful, we have to take account of it. Of course it is. So is white nationalism. But the point is we have to be the alternative. We cannot play in that space. We tried once, it was fatal. And we did a course correction. The point is that South Africa can only work if we judge each other by the content and the quality of our character, not the color of our skin. But there are South Africans like Julius Malema who mobilize and whip people up on the basis of racial nationalism, of course, all over the place. We know that. Our critical role is to show that that will fail. And the great thing is that we can win elections on that basis. The reason that I was out here is that I have over 20 coalitions to manage on a daily basis in which, the, which throw up at least 14 problems a day each. And I have to try and deal with them. But our job is to show the alternative can work, and we've got a demonstration effect. I mean, the Western Cape is almost now an ANC-free zone. When we finish doing our coalitions in that part of the Karoo that we're working with now and that I've been out on doing now, there'll be one municipality, one, Kanalant, in which the ANC is a minority partner in a coalition with a child rapist, which we won't do a coalition with. So, and that's, that's just true. It's not something that I'm making up or exaggerating. What I say is true. So, the bottom line is this. Of course there's black nationalism. And yes, it's going to be powerful and it's going to win. But so are we winning. And if Julius Malema wins in the Northwest province, I'm sorry for anybody who comes from Potch of Storm or anything like that, then we can compare what works and what doesn't work. And over time, the contestation is going to be between the non-racial vision, judging people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin, versus the racial nationalism one. And we will have that clear demonstration effect. We dare not play in the space of whipping up racial nationalism. Now, let me just talk about Cape Independence very briefly. We believe in maximal devolution. Where we govern, we want control over the police. We want control of transport. We want control of energy, not to control it, but to open up the space to the market. We believe that the private sector should be running the rail network, and then it would work again. We believe to be the facilitator of the free and open society. And we want to show that demonstration model against the centralized command and control model. And that is why we have that triangle. It is our vision versus the racial nationalist vision. And of course the racial nationalist vision exists, but we dare not play in the space. And the big challenge of the future is 2024 in Gauteng. That's where the big battle for the future is. Will the racial nationalist vision win out there, or will our vision win out there? And that's the battleground, 2024 is Gauteng. And the great thing is we currently have a mayor in all the four metros, Chwani, Mukhali City, Ikuruleni, and Joburg. Fragile coalitions, two minority coalitions, really, really difficult with even our coalition partners trying to bring us down on a regular occasion. But that's the battle for South Africa. And I'm not ignoring racial nationalism. I just say we dare not play in that space because we are the alternative to that. Thank you for ending or just about ending that on hope. You mentioned hope. You spoke about hope. Hope for the young people. Hope perhaps for, for what Stafford Marcy was saying a little earlier about the, the move towards a, a source of value or a store of value mm -hmm. that, that is not controllable. From, from what Helen said now, obviously you need to respond. Um, and, and thank you. Uh, for, for going out of the room and going and sorting out some of those coalitions. I think we, we realize what a big job you've got and we realize how, how critical that is. But maybe last word, Trevor. Um, I, I'm, 
I'm so hopeful uh, for the future of this country, uh, South Africa. Uh, I, th I think there's so much going for this country. But I just want to, a word of caution, that do not take uh, anything for granted. If you snooze, you lose. Uh, there was a time when South Africans were saying, oh, constitution, no constitution. But I think the Jacobism I experienced last time, hopefully, was a wake-up call to say, if you don't fight for uh, your constitution to defend it and so forth, uh, some people are going to grab it, and they've been grabbing, gra grabbing very, very slowly. When the constitution becomes tainted, and it is, uh, because it's labeled as belonging to somebody else, you've got a problem. So uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, journalism in this country used to be one of the things that I used to be excited about. I'm worried. I mean, the Guptas came into this country and messed up journalism, uh, uh, you know, and all those, those kind of stuff. So there, there, there's a sense of we need to go back to basics and do what we're doing. And uh, well done, Alec, for doing what you're doing. To, to respond to um, uh, Madame uh, Zile's uh, uh, comments. I think w w what I'm talking about is not, s rather, let me say briefly, Helen, the, I, I get the sense that you don't get what black South Africans are saying are their legitimate concerns. And I genuinely fear that unless those, unless there is a mm -hmm. conversation uh, with the motions out of it about what is it that would get black people to rally behind the DA, then I think in the next five years, if you and I had sat down and a cup of coffee, it would be interesting to, uh, to be able to compare notes. I think DA has a future. For as long as DA da is not dismissive of what Africans say are uh, the issues that they've concerns with, with, the, with the DA. There's a danger of uh, the DA being irrelevant uh, and, and preaching to a very minority. If, if white people in South Africa don't get that, and, and, and get me clearly, uh, uh, Helen, I'm one of those people who absolutely, we, we need to work together. Uh, it's the content of somebody's character rather than, than, than the, um, uh, their color or anything of that sort. But, Perceptions are reality. Perceptions are reality. And the DA needs to address the perception that is in the minds of black people as far as politics is concerned. I'll end it there. Thank you very much.